To recall from the previous lecture, in this example, in the lecture 4, we have completed step 1 until step 4. Therefore in this lecture, we're going to proceed with step 5, step 6 and step 7. Clause 6.2.6, .6, refer to the shear buckling resistance design. Refer to the red box, as the ratio of HW, over TW, is lesser than, the 72 times, of the ratio of strain, over the conversion factor. Therefore, no shear buckling check is required. Note, for standard rolled beams and columns this check is rarely necessary. Thus, we have completed step number 5. The next step is, to check resistance to flange-induced buckling. To prevent the possibility of the compression flange buckling in the plane of the web, EC3 Part 5 requires, that, the ratio HWTW, of the web, should satisfy the criterion given in equation 8.1, in which the description of the value is shown in the green box. The factor K assumes the following values, plastic rotation utilized, is for the class 1 flanges. Plastic moment resistance utilized is for the class 2 flanges. Elastic moment resistance utilized is for the class 3 or class 4 flanges. This figure shows an example of flange induced web buckling. In this figure, we notice that the flanges failed to cater the applied force. As the flange is unable to resist the applied load, thus, it started to cripple and finally buckled. When the flange is buckled, while the load is keep increasing, the applied forces will later transfer to the web, causes it to experience buckled. Though it is rare that, flanged induced buckled happened in UB section. It is worthwhile to check in order to prevent any possibilities of the compression flange buckling in the plane of the web. Therefore, for our example, by applying the equation 8.1 in clause 8, EC3 part 1.5, it has been determined that the proposed UB section has met the criterion given in equation 8.1 as shown in the calculation in the red box. OK class, we now have completed step number 6. That is, the resistance to flange induced buckling. Lastly, we need to check for resistance of web to transverse force. This is the final step under the ultimate limit state check. Resistance of the web to transverse forces can be referred to clause 6, EC3 part 1-5. EC3-5, clause 6, distinguishes between two types of forces, applied through a flange to the web. The first is forces resisted by shear in the web, refer to point 1 A and C. And second is forces transferred through the web directly to the other flange which refer to point 1b. Detail explanation on the load condition is explained next. If the load is applied based on the clause 6.12 a and c, in which the load is applied through the flange and resisted by shear forces in the web. The possible failure mechanism of this type of forces are crushing of the web close to the flange and it will be accompanied by yielding of the flange, the combined effect sometimes, referred to as web crushing. Also, another possible failure mode are localized buckling and crushing of the web beneath the flange. Meanwhile, if the beam is loaded as stated in clause 6.2b, why by forces transferred through the web directly to the other flange. In this case, the failure mechanism will be buckling of the web over most of the depth of the member, provided that the compression flange is adequately restrained in the lateral direction. Provided that, in our example, the compression flange is adequately restrained in the lateral direction, the design resistance of webs of rolled beams under transverse forces can be determined in accordance with the recommendations contained in clause 6 of EC3-5. Here, it is stated that the design resistance of webs to local buckling is given by equation 6.1. Okay. Now let's check the resistance of the beam web to transverse forces. By applying equation 6.1, in clause 6, EC3 part 1-5, you are required to determine few parameters, and the parameters are Yield strength of the web Effective length of the web Thickness of the web While partial safety factor, you don't need to determine, 
as we know the value is 1. Let's find the parameters, that is the yield strength of the web. As previously determined, the yield strength of the web is 275 newton millimeter. Thickness of the web is 7.3 millimeter. Partial factor is 1. Thus, as you can see, the only parameter that we must determine is the effective length. Next, is to determine the effective length of the beam LEFF. Effective length is determined by multiply reduction factor with the effective loaded length LY. Reduction factor can be calculated by referring to EC3 Part 15, Clause 6.41, Equation 6.3. However, before you can determine the reduction factor, first you need to calculate the lambda bar F parameter by referring to EC3 Part 15, Clause 6.41, Equation 6.4, and the effective loaded length, Ly, can be determined by referring to Clause 6.5, 1, 2, 3, FCR value is determined from EC3 Part 15, Clause 6.4, 1, Equation 6.5. While, the value of KF, can be determined based on Figure 6.1, EC3 Part 15. From this slide, we can see that, for you to determine the reduction factor, first you need to determine lambda bar F. And, to determine the lambda bar F, you must first calculate the effective loaded length LY, and the FCR and KF value, whereby the KF value can be referred to figure 6.1. Here are the extracted clause 6.4, 1, 2, and 3, from EC3 part 1 and 5, to determine the reduction factor. And this is the figure 6.1, which provide guidelines to determine KF. This figure shows the buckling coefficients for different types of loadings. As previously mentioned, the first type of loading is forces resisted by shear in the web. The buckling coefficients for this case can be referred to loading type A and type C. Meanwhile, the second type of loading, which forces transferred through the web directly to the other flange, the web is likely to fail as a result of web crushing. Therefore, the buckling coefficients for this case can be referred to loading type B. Clause 6.3 provide a guideline to determine the length of stiff bearing SS. To calculate FCR, we need to determine KF in our case, the forces applied to one flange only, and adjacent to an unstiffened beam, and the compression flange is restrained. Therefore the load type is fall under the loading type C. To recall from earlier lecture, Type C is the condition of load, whereby the forces is resisted by web. And perhaps you may ask, what is the difference between type A and type C? Type A is still resist the forces through the web, but, unlike in type C, in type A, the beam have a vertical stiffness. To calculate KF, we need to determine the stiff bearing length, and the C value. EC3 Part 15 Clause 6.3 provide a guideline to calculate the SS value. The length of stiff bearing on the flange is the length over which the load is effectively distributed at a slope of 1 to 1. However, the length SS should not be greater than height of the web. The value of C is defined as shown in figure 6.1 earlier. As for an example, case A and case B shows two different cases to determine the C value. For case A, the C value is equal to 0 as the bearing is located at each end of the beam. Meanwhile, for case B, the C value is equals 50 mm, as you can see there is a 50 mm gap between the bearing to the end of the beam length. In this case the length of bearing on the flange is 100 mm, thus SS equals 100 mm. Finally, insert the value in the equation, and you will get FCR is equal to 840,024 Newton. Next. We need to determine the value of Ly. However, first we need to determine M1 and M2. M1 is calculated using equation 6.8. Meanwhile, M2 is calculated using equation 6.9. M2 can be calculated by assuming lambda f is either larger or lesser than 0.5. According to clause 6.5, for our example cases, Ly is taken as the smallest value attained from equations 6.11 and 6.12, whereas, equation 6.13 give the formula for LE. 
OK, let's recalculate the value of LE. First, we need to determine M1 by using equation 6.8 and M2 by using equation equation 6.9. We get M1 is equal to 23.5. Next, to calculate M2, we first assumed that lambda bar is larger than 0 0.5. Hence give equation 6.9 as highlighted in red. By substituting the required values into equation 6.9, we then finally get M2 is equal to 16.73. We then now determined the value of LE, and results to 232.5 mm. As the value of 232.5 mm, is larger than the summation of, SS and C value, which is 100 mm. Therefore value of LE is taken as 100 mm. Finally, Substitute all the determined value into the equation 6.11 and equation 6.12. Equation 6.11 gives the LY value of 217.3 mm, while equation 6.12 gives the LY value of 172.9 mm. Therefore, in this example, our LY is equal to 172.9 m. As the value of LY and FCR have been determined, thus, we can now substitute those values in the lambda bar f equation, as highlighted in the red box. Finally, the value of lambda bar f is equal to 0 0.6428, which is larger than 0 0.5, and has agreed with the assumption we made earlier. However, if the lambda bar f value is smaller than 0 0.5, hence you must recalculate the m2 value. And repeat all the process again. Next. The value of reduction factor also has been determined to be 0 0.778, which is lesser than 1. Which is okay finally, the value of LEFF is equal to 134.5 mm. So now, all the parameters have been determined. The yield strength of the web is 275 newton mm. Thickness of the web is 7.3 mm. Partial factor is 1. And the LEFF is 134.5 mm. Finally, we can ensure that the proposed beam web is able to resist the transverse forces. Therefore in this lecture, step 5, step 6 and step 7 have been completed. In the next lecture, we will learn on service ability limit states check. Okay everyone, see you on the next lecture.